Hey, welcome back everybody. Hopefully another informative video today. Following on to the video I did a week or so ago where someone asked me what did a choke do in a tube amplifier, I've had someone else follow up with a similar question to me and they basically said, hey Mark, curious, I hear a lot about people using thermistors. I've heard you mention it a few times and just curious what role they would play and why or when you might want to use one of those in a tube amplifier. So I thought it was a perfect little topic to discuss thermistors today. But before we dive into that, I thought I'd just give you a quick update. Um, here in North Carolina, we survived the uh, Hurricane Florence. Uh, you know, I'm a, little, I'm a little bit outside of Winston-Salem, and uh, fortunately the storm kind of skirted around us. We got a ton of rain. I can't even count how many inches over the last few days. But the wind wasn't too bad, and uh, did some work over the last few weeks to try to alleviate this uh, issue I've had with my basement flooding. And uh, fortunately, it did not flood over this, uh, this little incident. So that's a wonderful thing. All right, having said all that, let's dive on into this video. Okay, recently in one of my, in my Soapbox Sunday videos, I, uh, I talked about my audience and what level I was trying to operate at. And uh, I've kind of came to the conclusion this little uh, petition here of uh, Ohm's Law is about as deep as I'm going to go. So people that can follow some basic, basic multiplication, division, um, square root, and squaring of things, if you can do that stuff, you can probably follow my videos, and I'll try to keep them going much deeper than that as we get into these. I'm going to take a two-prong approach to this video. The first one will be a little bit of slideware, PowerPoint. Um, and then we'll actually jump over here on the bench and do a little bit of demo, much like we did in the uh, choke video. So up first, what the heck is a thermistor? A thermistor is a resistor, and I think at this point most of us know what a resistor is. A resistor is something that goes in a circuit and it adds some element of resistance, in other words, um, a hindrance to current flow uh, within that circuit. And a thermistor is a resistor with a negative or a positive temperature coefficient. Mm, what the heck does temperature coefficient and all that mean? Well, if you look at this little graph I've got down here, it'll kind of help you understand. So what it's trying to say is it is a device whose resistance depends or varies based upon the temperature of that device. So something that has a negative temperature coefficient, the hotter that device gets, the lower the resistance of that device. So in other words, when it's cold, it has a higher resistance, and as it gets warm, the resistance goes down um, closer to zero. Something with a positive temperature coefficient would be something that um, when it's cold, it has very low resistance, and as it heats up, it gets more and more and more resistance. And there are, there are perfect uses for both of these in various circuit applications. When we start talking about a tube amplifier and inrush current limiting, we're going to want to use a negative temperature coefficient. In other words, high resistance to start with, and then that resistance drops down as this device heats up. And then down here in the bottom, we have two um, traditional symbols that represent a um, thermistor. The one on the left is the IEC standard, and the one on the right has been around for a long time. I kind of like the one on the right a little more because it actually has a minus T on it, which tells you that this has a negative temperature coefficient versus uh, the one on the the one on the left over here, you wouldn't know that's an NTC or a uh, PTC, but um, either one of these are uh, standard in today's circuits. Okay, so why might we use a thermistor in a tube amplifier? Well, if you look at this little chart I've got on the right over here, when you first hit the power switch on a tube amplifier, there is a large inrush of current that happens. It happens, this is within milliseconds of hitting the power switch. And there's a couple things that cause that. First off, the primary winding on your power transformer is seen by the AC circuit feeding it as a very large inductor. When you first feed a large inductor, there's a large spike in current. And the same with the capacitors. Um, typically, you know, in the power supply, you have these large reservoir capacitors. Before a capacitor gets charged, it's pretty much seen as a short. Um, and as it starts to charge, the resistance in a capacitor goes down. So both the, uh, the inductor, the transformer, and the uh, capacitor cause this large inrush of current that may, may take place for a second or two um, when this amplifier is first turned on. 
And with that large inrush of current taking place, it, um, it, it can kind of wreak havoc on some of the components within your amplifier. So on to the next one. It provides a slow start to the heater tubes, okay? Typically, heater, the heaters or filaments within a tube, when they are cold, their resistance is typically about a tenth of what the resistance is when they're warm, which means they let a lot of current flow through them. Um, so you kind of got this double whammy of cold heaters and you've got this large inrush of current. And I got a question here. When do light bulbs generally fail? You tell me every time in your house you've ever turned on a light bulb or watched a light bulb fail. It inevitably almost always fails when you first turn it on. And you wonder, well, why? Why, why are you not just sitting there with your lamp on and the bulb goes out? It doesn't happen that way. Nine times out of ten, you flip the switch on to your lamp, you see this bright light flash, and then all of a sudden it's gone. There, your lamp, your uh, light bulb has died. It's the exact same reason. The filaments are cold, and you have this large inrush of current. Um, so this slow start that this thermistor will provide, and we'll get into how it does that here in a minute, um, helps kind of offset and uh, allow these heaters to warm up and cut down on this inrush of current. And a third reason that we might would um, use a thermistor is to help prevent something called cathode stripping, i.e. cathode bombardment. So when you first turn the power on, this filament's cold, um, it gets bombarded with uh, electrons or ions, um, and theoretically it kind of weakens the, uh, the cathodes. Now, this is a very debatable topic in the industry. You'll have a lot of people say, this only applies in very large transmitting tubes over 10,000 volts. You'll have other people say, no, this plays out in uh, regular tubes. And so I'm going to stay out of that one because uh, I, I haven't gotten close enough to the physics and the design of the internals of a tube to know the answer. Uh, I'll just trust that there's debate. And so I don't, I don't know what to believe on this one. Uh, but it can't hurt. That's kind of where I'm at. Uh, the next reason here it helps reduce the overall input voltage to older power transformers. Maybe not a lot, but a little bit, and every little bit might help, might help these days. I'll tell you, when you're running a 110 volt, you know, you've got an old tube amp from, say, to the 1960s. I've, I'll just make this up, a, maybe a Fisher 500 or a Scott um, 299 or something. Those transformers, the primaries were wound for 110 volts. And now you plug it into your wall here, and you're feeding it with 120 volts. Well, guess two things are happening when you do that. First and foremost, you're putting more voltage out the secondary. Remember, what you feed on the primary and what comes out on the secondary is direct proportion to the windings ratio in that transformer. So the more you feed in, the more you get out, which is ultimately not great for your amplifier. You're running tubes at plate voltages higher than you plan to. You're running grid voltages higher than you plan to. Um, light bulbs in the unit, uh, maybe they're supposed to be getting, uh, you know, 6 volts, and all of a sudden now they're getting 7.2 volts or whatever. Uh, it's just not good on the longevity of the amplifier. So one way you can do that, even if you can offset a volt or two, um, it helps. Now, it's not as, not as good as using maybe a bucking transformer or a variac to lower the voltage down to 110, um, but, but, you know, every little bit helps here. Um, and then the last, why do you use a thermistor? Because they're dirt cheap. They're, they're like, I buy them in bulk, so I end up getting them for like 80 cent a piece or less. But, um, I mean, even if you went on eBay and ordered a pack of five or so, um, you'd pay between a dollar and three dollar to, dollars, depending on uh, which ones you picked up um, or whatnot. So, they're cheap. Why, then why not use one is, is, is the question. I mean, uh, it, it can't hurt. So hopefully this chart will help you kind of put it all together if you haven't quite got a grasp around what I'm talking about. First, you can see down here, these things are made by different companies. GE makes them, Amphenol makes them, uh, I don't know, a couple other companies. Um, they're typically the type CL uh, for current limiting is what you're wanting to use. And um, typically I use an NTC, the negative temperature co coefficient. And you can see they typically look about like this bottom one down here. And in tube amplifiers, I've seen everything used from a CL60 up to about a CL90. Um, and I pulled this right out of the GE um, data sheet for these thermistors, and I just made a little spreadsheet here to, 
to kind of look at it. So let's let's just focus on one here. Um, maybe let's start with the CL80, okay? What it tells you is that when it is cold, there is 47 ohms of resistance. And then you come over here and you look at this thing, this little section here called steady state current. And what it'll tell you is a CL80 is designed to work in a circuit that pulls anywhere from a half of amp of current up to about three amps. Well, most of the amps I work on, just uh, smaller, um, single-ended or small push-pull, um, you know, hi-fi amplifiers, they will, I'll just throw this out there. Let's just say they pull about two amps. Most of them will run a, about a, either a two or a three amp slow blow fuse. So let's just say this amp is going to pull two amps, okay? Um, and what you'll notice here is that when you first turn it on, you have 47 ohms of resistance in this. And then if you look at um, two ohms being kind of your current steady state load, right? Well, when you're running at two amps, which would be about 75% of three amps, if you'll notice here, you'd be pulling about 0.71 ohms of resistance under this thing. So how does this thing go from 47 ohms of resistance down to 0.71 ohms of resistance? Well, that takes place because this device heats up along the way. And so if you put in a CL70, it starts out with 16 ohms. And then as it warms up, you would only have 0.39. But you kind of have to look over here where you might be. In this one, at 1 to 4, I'd be halfway in the middle. So I would be at about 50% load. So there's not a lot of difference here. I'd either have 0.65 ohms or 0.71 ohms. In other words, pretty much this thing kind of moves out of the way. And after, after a few seconds, after it warms up, it kind of moves out of the way and lets the circuit perform as normal. But in those first few seconds, you've got a whole lot of resistance here to help that inrush of current go into all the components in your amplifier. Okay, let's talk about not just how this can help with inrush current and uh, that huge uh, current spike uh, when you first turn your unit on, but also how it can help while the amp is running in steady state uh, by reducing the input voltage to your transformer. So let's just say we had a CL80 in our circuit and we were running at about an amp and a half. Um, so we, and if you kind of look there, we're kind of halfway in the middle. So at about a 50% load, looks like we would have 1.2 um, ohms of resistance while this thing is in steady state. And if we come over here to our little Ohm's Law formula, V is equal to I times R, or the voltage drop across something is equal to the current flowing through it times the resistance within it. So V is equal to an amp and a half times the 1.2 that we pointed out here. We would be dropping 1.8 volts at all times. So instead of 120 volts feeding into this amplifier or 117, whatever your house circuit is, you could reduce that by almost 2 volts, by 1.8 volts. And every little bit helps in kind of helping keep your transformer cool uh, because that extra voltage uh, can translate into more heat for your transformer. So. Hopefully this helps you understand, and you just kind of have to pick which one you're going to use. I use a lot of CL70s and a lot of CL80s, and it kind of depends. If it's a larger circuit pulling two or three amps, I'll run a CL70. If it's a smaller circuit pulling an amp, amp and a half or so, I typically run a CL80. Um, you can run the CL90 if you want. Um, it's not huge differences here we're talking about, guys. The one thing about the CL90 that I will say is it's a little bit larger device, uh, gets into being about the size of a, uh, getting closer to a quarter. These others are a little bit more the size of a dime or so, maybe the, maybe the size of a nickel versus a dime. All right, and the last slide here, how to use a thermistor. Um, you insert it in line after the fuse and the switch before the primary of the transformer. So I kind of redrew uh, my single-ended 807 amplifier uh, front end right here kind of had the switch, you kind of had the fuse, and then you had the CL80. Um, a lot of times I don't put it into the schematic, when, but when I'm actually building the amplifier, I do. So um, just another thing to consider when installing a thermistor, be careful what you put it near. These things do get hot. Um, so I try to typically put it in an amplifier, one where it has lots of air around it so that it can uh, kind of get air to cool it off. I don't like to wedge it up against something. And I also like to make sure there's no components right on top of it. Um, 
And one last little thing to note about these things before we jump over to the bench. Uh, Thermistor only protects you from inrush current when the device is cold. So let's say your device has been on for 30 minutes and you flip it off and you flip it right back on and that inrush of current you're going to get, the thermistor is not going to help you because the thermistor is still hot and not had time to cool down. So it, it doesn't help with transient uh, power, you know, brownouts or whatever. It's just when the amplifier is cold and turning it on for the first time, which should be about 98% of the time. Okay, over here on this multimeter we've got a CL80 um, turned on. Um, CL80 connected to it, and on this multimeter here, we have got a CL70 hooked to it. If you'll notice, this one's at 43 ohms, and this one's at about 15.6 ohms. Alright, so what we're going to do now is we're going to apply heat to both of these. And I'm just using a little uh, surface mount. Watch this. Do you see what's happening? The resistance on these units dropping significantly. I'll just apply heat to this one first. Um, it's getting on down there. Same on this one over here. As I apply heat to it, the resistance drops, 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 drops. So you get, you kind of get the feeling. I mean this thing's hot. It's 300 degrees um, right now. And um, so these thermistors get pretty hot when they, you know, when their resistance gets down there. But you kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about, how with, with heat the, the uh, resistance goes down and how that would play out in your circuit. Okay, and the way these thermistors actually work in a circuit, you don't have to apply external heat to them. Uh, they build up their own heat. So the current flow th throwing through them with the resistance, um, especially in the beginning, produces heat. They get hot and then their resistance drops and they stay hot. Um, so these things stay pretty warm the whole time they're running. So hope that makes sense to you. And um, this may be more than you ever wanted to know about a thermistor. And sorry, I'm 16 minutes or so into this thing. I thought it was going to be a 10 minute video, but you know me, I just like to yak sometimes. So um, thanks for watching everybody. Keep the questions coming. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can.